Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Good morning. I'm not, I'm not used to not speaking without a microphone, so I'm not going to know what to do with my hands, so <laughs> just be prepared for some awkward you know, hands. Uh, but that's why I want to welcome you to church. Thank you for coming and for being here. Uh, thank you for joining us online, all my friends joining us online. Um, you know, again, this morning is kind of a unique experience, but I've been enjoying kind of this intimate experience that we're having with the church family this morning in you know, a worship. You know, it's super powerful to hear us all just singing together and worshiping our King and our Creator together. And so, so far, it's been an incredible, incredible morning. And so thank you for being here. And the lights are obviously back on, which is also a good opportunity. So, uh, but we've been uh, working through this series, uh, Questions God Asks Us, as we know, and we've been going through, again, some of the questions God, have, God has asked us. And I hope, again, that you've been enjoying this series. We've only got a couple left. But it's been an awesome series to walk through some of the questions that God has asked us throughout Scripture. And we know they're important because God's the one asking the question. Not just me or your spouse or your kids asking the question. It's me. And so we've been walking through these. But I don't know if you've ever been asked this question is, who are you? Somewhere to ask you, to, to you, say, hey, who are you? What would you? How would you describe yourself to them? How would you explain who you were? We all have different parts of who we are. We might be a husband or a mother or a cousin, an uncle. You know, we might be an engineer. We might be a construction worker. I don't know how you would describe yourself. We have a lot of avenues to describe who we are as people. Again, for me, I'm a follower of Jesus, as many of us are in this room. I'm a pastor and a father and a husband and a friend and a son and uncle and a co-worker. And, and there's different parts of who we are. And there's a lot of things that we like to share about ourselves. But how many know there's other things about us we don't really enjoy sharing? One of those things about me is that I have a snoring problem. You know how I know? It's because Beth tells me. <laughs> we have to sleep in our room. We sleep with the sound machine because of how loud my snoring can be. And so that's part of who I am. So one thing about me too is I don't mind cold coffee. And I'm not talking like iced coffee. I'm talking about just coffee that's been sitting out for a bit. I don't mind drinking it. Now I tell people that and they think I'm, I'm out of my mind, right? They think like, how could you enjoy uh, a cold cup of coffee? But there's parts of us that we like to share, but there's other parts of us that we don't enjoy sharing. And there's this moment in scripture that Jesus asks his disciples a similar question. And we can read it together in the book of Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 13. It says this, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the son of man is? Who do people say I am? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. The question Jesus poses to his disciples is, who do they say I am? It's an interesting question, and I've never asked this question to people before. I've never said to Beth, who do people say I am? And I've never put it on Facebook or Instagram asking the question, who do you say I am? It's usually not the question that we ask, who do they say I am. And it got me thinking about me is, is who would people say I am? Who would people say Dustin is? And who would they say? Would they say I'm a good man or a, an angry man or a loving father? Am I impatient? Am I fair? Am I just? Am I forgiving? Am I loving? How would people describe who I am as a person? And if I've maybe had this, like, what would people say about us at our funeral as a question but sometimes we think about how would people think about me? What would they say about me? Jesus asks this question, who do they say I am? And it's an interesting question. Who does the world think Jesus is? And in the context it would have been, who do the Jewish leaders, who do the Romans think I am? Maybe the answer would have been maybe a mythical man who came and, and bring unity to the people. Or a man who lived uh, for us a couple thousand years ago and did amazing things. 
Now the question maybe even today might be, you know, did, act, did Jesus actually walk on this earth and do all the things we read about in scripture? Who do they say I am? See, the, the crowds, the, the, the Pharisees, the leaders, the people around viewed Jesus as a prophet. They viewed him as a good man, or he was a rabbi, he was their teacher, he was a carpenter. That's how they knew Jesus. They described him as maybe he's one of the prophets who's kind of come back. That was their answer. But the interesting thing about this is that the people at the time, how did they view Jesus? They viewed him based on what he did, not based on who he was. I think we have the same problem sometimes in our culture and our families as we view each other based on what we do, not based on, who, uh, uh, based on who we are. And I think sometimes we judge each other, judge each other based on our lowest moments. We, we judge each other based on our lowest moments as people. And as we all know, we all have low moments. We all have low moments as parents. And we all have low moments as, as spouses. And we all have low moments at work. We all have low moments. And they viewed Jesus based on what he did, but they didn't actually know Jesus. They saw him teach. They saw him do miracles. They saw him whip up a temple, right? They saw him, but did they actually know him? They got fed by him physically, if you remember the stories, but I think many of them missed him spiritually. They ate his bread, but they didn't actually eat his words. See, there's even a moment, just a few chapters before this, this story, where Jesus is speaking to a few thousand people, and they get hungry. So, of course, he does is he feeds all these people with just a little bit of food, and then they leave. But what happens if you know the story? They follow him. They want more. You know, they, they want to have their physical needs met. They want to make sure that they're fed. They're like, man, this guy fed us for free. It's an easy way to take my family out for dinner after Sunday church. Right? This is how they viewed him, by, based on what they could get from him. Not because of what he could do for them spiritually, but because of what he could do for them physically. See, if we view Jesus as just a physical being, we're going to miss the entire point. We're going to miss the entire point. And after this moment, Jesus asks his disciples, who did they say? Um, he turns to his disciples and asks a different question. And the question is this. He said to them in verse 15, who do you say I am? It's a different question, right? Not who do they say, say I am. The question is who do you say I am? And I think sometimes this is a question that maybe is people who maybe follow Jesus for a long time. We actually haven't thought about this question. Who is Jesus? You know, today we're living in an age where we have, you know, the New Testament the disciples at this time, they were living it out, right? They were still trying to figure it out. And we had a few thousand years of trying to understand who Jesus is. But maybe we're sitting here today or maybe we're watching online and we view Jesus the same way the crowd did in that moment. Maybe we view him as a man who lived a long time ago, who did some really cool things. And people are still talking about him today. Maybe he was a prophet sent by God, similar to Moses or Elijah. Maybe you're sitting here today, or again, maybe you're watching us today, and you don't even know if you believe Jesus was even a part of the human story. You don't even know if you believe what the Bible teaches about who Jesus is. Maybe you're struggling with your own faith of, of how could God let such hard things happen, or maybe you're struggling with understanding how it all intertwines. I want to encourage you, you're not alone in a lot of those questions. These are questions that we've been facing as humanity for a long time, trying to understand how big and majestic and beautiful our God is. We're trying to understand it. Who do you say I am? And it might be a question that we need to think about in our own, in our own space is, who do I say Jesus is? Who is this man? And Peter, he's the first one to answer the question, as Peter always is. He's always the one to do the action step and think later. Kind of reminds me of myself. And, and, and this is how Peter responded. So Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now this was a powerful statement in this moment. I think sometimes we read past the answer because we've read it so many times or we understand 
what it says and what it means, but Peter's response was very different from the response Jesus got when he asked them, who do they say I am? Because who did they say Jesus was? Again, a rabbi, a teacher, a prophet, a carpenter, the God that they'd seen do the miraculous, maybe sent by God, but, but, but Peter has a different response. He says, you are the Son of God. You are God came to earth to rescue us. The Savior of the world, the Messiah, that's who you are. Now this would have been a statement and an idea and a thought that would have not gone out very well amongst the people around. In fact, this is the same statement that really led Jesus to his death was they would have considered this blasphemous. Huh? This man isn't God. This is Jesus the carpenter. This is, this is Jesus. He's just a really good prophet. This would have been a statement that would have been new for them at this time. They're thinking, this is this the man. Peter said, you are the man that we have been waiting for. You are the savior of the world. You have to understand the context. Why this, this statement is so important. See, Jewish people at the time, they had read the Torah. They knew the prophecies. They knew that someone was going to come and rescue them. That the Savior, the Messiah, was going to come. And some thought, including many of the disciples, that the Messiah would come to rule over Israel. To be the king, sit on a physical throne and take them out of some of the oppression they were in as a culture. That's what they thought Jesus would kind of come in to like kind of lead a revolt against the oppression. And lead them out of bondage from nation after nation. If you read through the Bible, you know, they were, they're under attack all the time. And, and, and even in this context, they were expecting Jesus to be different than what they saw in front of them. They were expecting Jesus, I'm going to show up on a horse and start fighting everybody, right? But Jesus, if we know the story, Jesus showed up in a place of peace. Jesus showed up in a place of bringing life to the broken and to rescue us from our own sin. So what happened to these people who had been studying the Torah, in fact, many of them had it memorized. They had studied it, they knew it, they completely missed Jesus. In fact, they sent him to the cross because of this statement. The man that they had been waiting for, they have been studying their entire lives, waiting for, hoping for, they completely missed it. Yet what happens is Peter, he sees it. Peter knows in his heart that Jesus is who he says he is. That Jesus is the savior of the world, the son of God. He had a paradigm shift in his life. Because he knew that what was in front of him was what he had been waiting for. I think it's sometimes easy for us, just like the leaders of the time, to miss Jesus. We miss who he is actually is. I think sometimes we treat Jesus almost like a genie, right? We ask him, we're like, God, give me what I need, what I need, what I need. And there's not a lot of us where our devotion, we were saying about earlier, goes toward our Savior. A lot of the time, the faith we have is based on what Jesus can do for us physically, but it's so much deeper than our physical needs. It's our spiritual needs that matter. We don't can't miss Jesus. We get so caught up sometimes in how the world views Jesus. And if we know, you know, there's a big attack on Jesus and Christianity in our culture today. And we need to realize that Jesus is who he says he is. And we need to stand strong in that reality of who he is. Some of us, maybe we came to faith and we were thinking that the storm would cease when we came to faith. We came thinking, okay, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. And then all of a sudden, there's not going to be any pain anymore. There's not going to be any addiction anymore. There's not going to be any problems anymore. I'm going to live this perfect life. And those of us who have been Christians for 15 minutes, we know. Life keeps going on. The storms don't cease. The pain doesn't often disappear. The storm sometimes rages on inside of us and rages on around us. Because we thought everything would be dramatically better. Yet we still struggle with anxiety or we're still struggling with addiction and we're still struggling with our mental health or we're struggling with our physical health and we're wondering, God, where are you? But like we talked about last week, we talked about when Jesus healed the man, would you like to get well? But it's so much deeper than our physical health. That yes, it matters, but our spiritual well-being is very, very important. And the next part of the story, verse 17, 
This is what Jesus responded. It says this, And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now this is where we get this powerful statement. Where Jesus says, um, And I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. See, Peter understood who Jesus was before he understood his purpose, before he understood his potential, before he understood even who he was in Christ, he realized who Jesus was first. And I think as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we gotta know who Jesus is first. Not, it's not even about what Jesus can do for us. It's about, it's about who he is as a person, and how he is the son of God. See, Jesus is building his church. He's building his church in West Edmonton. He's building his church in Edmonton. He's building his church in Alberta, in Canada, North America, around the globe. He is building his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. And I think for us, we have to have the confidence that what Jesus said is going to happen is happening. Because he is continuing to build his church. Who do you say Jesus is for you in your life? We can't just have him as our Savior. We can't just have him as the Messiah. We have to realize that he is the Son of the living God. The same realization, the same revelation that Peter had, Peter, uh, that Peter had, we have to have in our old lives, in our own lives. See, oftentimes as followers of Jesus, you know what happens? As we start to view God like we viewed our own parents growing up, our own father growing up. And some of us, we have this skewed view sometimes of who God is because of how we were raised. And we need to push that to the side and understand who God is. We need to know who Jesus is for real. And you know who he is? He's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's the Almighty One, the Good Shepherd, the Bread of Life. The chief cornerstone, the deliverer, the Lamb of God, the light of the world, the Messiah. He's peace. He's our Savior. He's the way. He's the door. He's the truth and the life. The victorious one. He's Emmanuel. God with us. And he's the holy servant. That's who Jesus is. And we need to know who Jesus is. Because there's going to come times when people ask us. As his followers are going to ask us, who is Jesus? We better know who he is. And we can share part of our story. This is what Jesus has done in my life. And this is how Jesus has transformed my life. That's who he is and he will never change. What he did for you yesterday, he can do again today. We can't miss him like the crowds did. We can't miss him. Him when he is moving, when he's moving somewhere, we gotta follow him. We need to let his light guide us into the future and into our purpose. He can lead us through the storms and lead us through the waters and lead us through the valley. He is guiding, but are we making attention? When I was a kid, maybe you asked the same question, and maybe your kids could ask this question: Was what do you want to be when you grow up? Right? It's an, it's an important question, and I remember as a kid, it was always. I'm gonna be a firefighter. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be a police officer. I want, like all of us, at least as me as a young boy. I wanted to be a hero. Right? Whatever it took to be a hero. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a hero. I want to be a doctor. I want to be someone who can change the world. That was always my motivation and always who I wanted to be. And I always thought for me in my life, it, I wanted to do something that I could have value in helping people. It's always been my whole story. I remember when I was a kid, my, my parents would pack me a lunch and I'd go to school. You know, and I'd have friends who didn't have a lunch. They, whether they forgot it or their parents didn't make them one was irrelevant. They didn't have lunch that day. And I was always the one that always shared my lunch with people who needed it. But I don't really know if I liked the question 
You know, what do you want to do when you grow up? I think a better question is, who do you want to be? Who do, our, who do we want our kids to be when they grow up? Who do we want to be when we grow up? And I'm, I'm 30 years old and I still feel like I'm not grown up yet, right? Still trying to figure out who I want to be. And we got to change the question of what do you want to be is who do you want to be when you grow up? Because who is different than what? See, your what can change, right? Or what changes? Maybe your career changes or your job changes or your city changes. But who we are goes with us wherever we go. If you, were, if you were always showing up late to work in one place, it means that's probably going to follow you to your next place. Right? It's going to follow you where you go unless you change as a person. I think sometimes we get so caught up in our what, we forget about our who. Because our what is always, I want to do this, don't get in my way, don't cause me problems, I know what I'm doing. But our who changes that question into who I am. See, who I want to be is directly connected to who Jesus is. See, Jesus says to Peter, he says, hey, Peter, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. You know, and, and, and this rock that they're talking about, there's a few ideas, but the idea is, you know, on Jesus as a rock, we'll build the church. Or the thought or the idea that we have the understanding that God, that Jesus is the Son of God, that's how we build the church. But Peter had a pivotal role in growing the early church as well. That his purpose, he knew who Jesus was. Jesus said, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna, I'm going to build my church on this thought. I'm going to build my church on you knowing who I am. And then Peter goes and preaches and thousands come to know Jesus. Because he knew who Jesus was first. And who we want to be is directly connected to who Jesus is. If we want to know who we're supposed to be, we've got to get closer to Jesus. See, Jesus never changes. He doesn't shift the light to the shadows. He doesn't leave you tomorrow. He's not here today and gone tomorrow. He will never change who he is. That's what I want my future to look like. That's what I want our church future to look like. That no matter location, that no matter the pastor, that no matter all of it, that Jesus is our foundation. That we believe he is who he says he was. That no matter everything else, even as our mission statement says that we want to make Jesus known, that is our main goal and our main vision is to make Jesus known wherever we go. That's what I want our future to look like. A life filled with Jesus, filled with hope and filled with peace and filled with joy and filled with love. And purpose not in my own abilities. Because I know my abilities will fail me. I know my abilities as a leader will fail me. But yes, I'm, we might be talented, but eventually your talent will fail you. But our purpose found in Jesus. Because I know who he is first. He said, you are the Son of God. That's who you are. You're the Messiah. You're the Savior. You're who we've been waiting for. I know who he is first. I want to be like Peter. I don't want to be like the crowd. And again, this statement for Peter, this would have been something that could have caused him some serious problems in his life. And in fact, it did. You know, Peter's story. It caused him a lot of pain, but it brought a lot of people to Jesus. And I believe we're truly here today because of what the apostles did, obviously, way back. Give up their lives to spread the gospel. I believe that we ought to do the same. So who do you say that Jesus is? Is he just a teacher? Is he just a prophet? Is he just a mythical person who lived? We can read about him, be encouraged by. Or is he the son of God? Having this view of Jesus will change our lives that we're serving the living God. That Jesus came, went to the cross, died, was buried, came back to life, and went back up to heaven. He's still alive today. But who we serve isn't something that's just held in a book. It's something that we have access to everywhere we go. The love of Jesus. You know, as a church, let's be the church. Let's not just attend church. 
that if our spiritual fix or our spiritual lives are only Sundays, we're in trouble. We only have an hour, maybe two hours a week on Sunday to to grow together. And if that's our only time we have fellowship or the only time we we serve, it's the only time we're going to be in trouble. That being the church isn't just about a location or a building we go to. That's a blessing, but it's about going to where we go. And Sunday, often for a lot of us, is a place to get prepared to go into the week, go into the mission field, go to work, and go to school, and go to our families and spread the love of Jesus and show people who he is. We can't be ashamed of the gospel. We have to share it with the people God has graciously placed in our lives. Let's declare like Peter did, that Jesus is God. Jesus is our Savior, and Jesus is what we need in every moment. Who do you think Jesus is? Do you think he has the power to infiltrate every dark place of our lives? To overcome addiction, to overcome fear, to overcome anxiety? Do we believe he's powerful enough to do it? You know, I can't for you declare who Jesus is. I wish I could. I think sometimes we wish we could for our family. I, we can't do it for each other. It has to be an internal reflection of knowing who he is. We need to come to the same understanding that Peter did on who Jesus was. Even though he probably was very alone in that idea. Let's not be afraid of the response of the crowds. Let's be excited about the future that God has for us when we walk in his identity and who he is. Who do you want to be when you grow up? And how do we do that? How do we understand that? We got to become that today by declaring who he is. The more we know about Jesus, the more we serve Jesus, the more we know how powerful and beautiful and amazing he is, the more it's going to be a reflection in our own lives. And it doesn't matter what we do. It matters about who we are matters about what gets us up to love people. You know, in in John 8, verse 58, Jesus says this, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. This is a reflection from the Old Testament. He's saying, I am. You know, whatever we need from him, he is. Whatever we need, he already is. Before Abraham was, he says, I am. Is he strong enough to carry you through the storm? He is. Is he strong enough to save your marriage? He is. Is he strong enough to overcome addiction in your life? The answer is yes, he is. Is he able to change the hardest of hearts? Yes. Is he able to carry our heavy burdens? He is. Is he able to pick us up even when we fail? He is. Remember in the garden, Peter does not like that Jesus is getting arrested. He cuts off the guy's ear. Jesus just heals it quick and then gets arrested. Right? Even in our failure, Jesus will be there. Christ is enough for us. He's enough for you. He's enough for me when we realize who he is. You know, Romans 10, verse 9 to 10 says this. When it comes to giving our lives to Jesus, it says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, for us, if following Jesus, it's not, it doesn't have to be complicated. We simply have to confess that Jesus is the Son of God the same way Peter and believe that he came back to life and went up to heaven for you and for me. I want to maybe give us a moment. Maybe you want to give our life to Jesus today. Maybe something you haven't done in your life yet. This is a great opportunity to give your life to Jesus or maybe rededicate your life to Jesus. And the simple prayer we can really pray is, 
He said, Jesus, I give you my life. No, Jesus, I give you my life. I, I believe that you are the Lord of the earth, that you are the Son of God. And I believe you came and you died and you rose again and you went back up. The simple prayer of Jesus, I give you my life, I give you my brokenness, I give you my pain, I give you my story, and I say, God, turn it around. Make, make it whole, make me whole. Jesus, I give you my life. He's like, I give you my life. <clears throat> now maybe you're watching online or maybe you're here in this room and maybe you prayed that prayer or you want to pray this prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. And, you know, just send us a message on Facebook if you're watching or send us a message or find me and I'd love to pray with you and chat with you and walk you through what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. This prayer, Jesus, I give you my life. And maybe you're here in the room today and you prayed that prayer or you want to pray that prayer, come chat with me after or next week and love to chat with you about what that could look like in your life. But I want to pray for us today when it comes to this question, who do you say I am? My prayer is that we will have the same revelation that Peter had, that Jesus is the Son of God and that we will allow that to change our lives. That it will allow it to transform us and make us whole make us new. And so God, I thank you for today. I thank you, Jesus, that you are the Son of God. Jesus, we believe. We believe you are who you say you are. And God, I pray that that revelation, that idea, that thought, that that's how you build your church. So God, we declare that even over our church today, that you are the Son of God and you're our Savior. You're our Messiah. God, allow it to transform us. Allow us to not be so focused on what we want to do, but help us be focused on who we want to be. And who we want to be, God, is fully devoted followers of you. So God, we give, we give you our lives today. We give you our, this week to you. We give it the next few moments to you. And we say, God, let your will be done. We even say the same prayer. Here we are, God, send us. Send our church into our city to reach the lost. In Jesus' name, amen.